James 2.19 says this in the NLT. You say you have faith. James, I love the book of James. This dude's the brother of Jesus, right? Half brother. So if anybody knew Jesus, I think that his own brother did. You say you have faith for, and I'm still, I, I'm still stuck and in, in tremble. That's why I'm saying this. For you believe that there is one God. Good for you. Look at this, man. Look at this next part. Even the demons believe this and tremble in terror. That word God there, okay, in the Greek, as you know, is theos. And you know what that means? The Godhead, the Trinity. In other words, Jesus. The name of Jesus is equivalent to that right there. The demons, we, I don't think this is, I don't think this does any damage to the scriptures. You say you have faith and believe in Jesus. Use the name of Jesus. Confess the name. Why don't we get that today? Why don't we exercise our authority in the name of Jesus? I'm not talking about fake faith. Okay, I call fake faith or foolish faith when you uh, use the name of Jesus and use faith as an excuse to try to get what you want. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about manipulating faith and and and. Um, this was a thing, I think, before I was even born, like, the, the um, what's it called, like, uh, you know, just being all the way over too much to, the, to, the, to one side. Really, abusing is not the right word, but just kind of fake faith, you know? And I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about using faith, using the name of Jesus, just to, to, to put a bow on what fits your box. I'm talking about taking authority in Jesus' name. Using his name to have the demons tremble. Okay? He can't trespass on your property. He can't trespass on your kids. He can't trespass on your health. He can't trespass on your finances if you're using the name. But check this out. You can cross-reference this so you don't have to put it up. I, I, I'm, this, is, this is right off the top of my head here, so I hope I'm, I hope I'm, I'm doctrinally sound. Okay, they're taping this, so you can submit it to my dad, and he can, he can check me out. Even the demons believe this and tremble in terror. For you say you have faith. Now check this out. For you believe that there is one God. Mark eleven twenty three 23 says, Whoever says to the mountain, Be thou removed, right? But what does it say in the next verse, in verse number 24? For if he believes it in his heart. It's not about this using the name. That it's, this, this, that, that's, what the, uh, that's what the seven sons of Sceva, Sceva tried to do in Acts. Is it, is it chapter 16? When, remember when, when, when there was uh, people being freed from demonic influence and possession? And these seven boys of a, of a Jewish priest, they come, they come rolling by and they say, man, this looks good. Uh, these, these, these guys, are, they're, casting, they're casting demons out. These demons are trembling at the name of Jesus. We're going to get in on that. And they go and they use his name, right? They use his name. They use the name of Jesus. And what does the demon say? Jesus, I know... But this is this is really cool too. When you look at the word "no," he says, "Jesus, I know," and Paul, I know. Two different two different knows. There's multiple translations of, of of words all through the Bible, and and it's the same verse. And um, the demon says, "Jesus, I know," which when you break it down, it means. And you can check me out. I encourage you strongly to download a concordance to your phone, your tablet. You have to have it. You have to have it. It changes your perspective on life itself. Literally, your walk with God changes when you start reading words in the original languages. But when you, when you look at the word know, Jesus I know, it means, I'm just paraphrasing here, um, that I know who he, I know, we know who he is. It's established already. It's, it's, we've known him for a long time. And Paul I know, but that one actually means getting used to. In other words, this Paul's got us, right? We know Jesus from the foundations. He's had us trembling in terror since the beginning. But Paul's the one right now, right here, we're getting accustomed to him. He's got us shaking on our boots. But who are you, he says. Because just using the name, it's good to, it makes for good worship. Jesus, Jesus. It's true. It's all good. It's true. But just using the name isn't enough. Just, just professing, just Jesus' name, I'm, I'm healed, in Jesus' name, I'm free, in Jesus' name, I'm this, in Jesus' name, I'm that. You have got to believe it in here. And truly believe it. Convinced. Nothing can change your, your, your mind or your heart. Hundred proof truth. Amen? So, Holy Spirit, what are we doing here? Uh, 
I feel like that Charlotte myself. I don't know here. Jesus. Power in his name, man. We, and you know what? Once you start, you know that you, no pun intended, because my message was or is, whatever we're going to do here, entitled Stuck, okay? You know that you're growing as a Christian when your faith isn't shaken, when you don't get immediately what you are believing for, okay? I mean, we're coming off it right now. We're coming off a week of, like, craziness in the Arminio house. Kids battling bad, bad stuff. We were in faith, speaking the word, using the name. And it didn't necessarily manifest as, as quick as you want to. What do you do at that point? What do you do? Do you, do you, well, I guess, guess what they tell me every week isn't true. Do you get your faith shaken or do you dig in? Okay? And maybe that's a good segue because there's a lot of people in the church, and I'm talking about abundant life per se, although I'm sure there's a lot of people in abundant life, in the church of Jesus Christ at large, who are not bound. Okay, I said it before. The woman with the spirit of infirmity, she was bound. Okay? Um, the, the girl in Acts 16, chapter 16, verse number 16, I believe. Okay? She's, she's remember the damsel that was following Paul around in, in Philippi? Saying, these men are servants of the Most High God. The Bible says she was bound with a spirit of divination. It's the only, only place in the Bible that that word is used. Divination is used many times. The only, only time that Greek word divination is used. Um, and many others. A lying spirit, a, a haughty spirit, spirit of fear, spirit of death, um, a perverted spirit. There's, there's, there's another time, I think it's Acts, um, I don't know the exact chapter, but when Paul comes face to face with Bar-Jesus, Elymas, and, and, and he's in Paphos, a town called Paphos, and Paul goes and he sees Sergius Paulus. Remember that story? He's, he's, um, the, the, he's called the deputy or the proconsul of the, of the town. And Sergius Paulus is, is interested in the gospel. He's intrigued by what he hears. He, he wants to know more. And, and Elymas, Bar-Jesus, comes and it says he starts perverting his words. The spirit of perversion on, on him. And Paul, and Paul, you know, Paul takes authority. And blinds him in Jesus' name. And Sergius Paulus sees that and gets saved. What am I saying? There's people that, yes, go through these bondages. Okay, 15, 16, 17 different spirits by name throughout the 66 books of the Bible that we study. And to get free from bondage, you need spiritual deliverance and spiritual breakthrough. Okay, 12 steps to being free from a, from a spiritual demonic bondage does not work. Okay, discipline does not work. It helps, does not work. The only way that... Are you someone sand, using sandpaper in here? I got a table at home that I can bring in real quick. What was I saying? Um, yeah. To, to, when you, 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 can't, you can't clinically get free from spiritual bondage. You know what I'm saying? It takes... When, there's, when, when something is bound, when a person is bound, there needs to be spiritual loosing that happens. All right, I've, I've tried as much as I can in my young adult life to study that, but there's a lot of, a lot of digging in the, in the Bible, specifically the New Testament, to get there. But being stuck is not being bound. Okay? We know that there's a sliver, a percentage of people in the body of Christ that are bound, that are in bondage. Okay? You have to discern if it's something that you need to just fix, that's in your power, or if, if there's a spirit. If you're a fibber, stop fibbing. But biblically speaking, you could have a lying spirit. If you can't stop lying, lying to the government, lying to your boss, lying to your pastor, you might need a, you might need a lying spirit cast right out of you, man. I'm just being, keeping it real. But I don't believe that that's the majority of people. I believe that there's a minority of believers that are in, are in true bondage and need spiritual breakthrough. I believe the majority of believers that are battling are just stuck in their own way. Stuck within themselves. Undisciplined. Complacent at times. Lazy at times. Okay, I've been through many seasons of stuck myself in my life. I can remember those seasons. I can remember how frustrating. When, you, when you're stuck, 
okay? And I know I'm going to be jumping all over the place today, guys, in the back. When you're stuck, okay, it, it, it causes frustration. Okay, think about in the, in the natural sense of the word, when you're stuck in traffic, okay? And what do you feel like when you're stuck in traffic on Route 80? Frustrated, right? Want to get out. Want to abandon your car. I saw this crazy video one time. Put the, you can put that slide up. When you're stuck, you get one, two, three. Uh, I saw this crazy video one time. I don't, I don't think it was fake. I think it was real. I think over in Asia, their traffic was so bad, it lasted like two weeks or something like that. And people just started leaving their cars. They started to put, just got out of their cars, left it, took their briefcase, and walked. And they were there for weeks. Like, I, my mind was blown with that. That's what you... That's what happens when you get stuck. You become frustrated, all right? When you get stuck, you put yourself at risk or others, right? Any road ragers in here? Don't put your hand up. The spirit, I think that's the 17th spirit of the New Testament, the spirit of road rage. They used to do it on their donkeys, though, and, and horses. We do it in our, in our cars. Spirit of road rage, come out of them. Come out of them. When you get stuck, you become frustrated, you put yourself at risk or others, right? And most importantly, you can't reach your destination. Okay, I'm not talking about bondage today. We know that the name of Jesus breaks chains. We know that the power, there's power in the name of Jesus to, to say, woman, thou art loose, stand up. We get all that. I'm talking about being stuck in our spiritual walk within ourselves, okay? Jesus is in the, in the synagogue in John chapter 8. And, and he says, I think it's verse number 31 it starts with, if you want to put that on the, on the screen. He says to the Jewish believers, the Jewish believers, okay, let's read it. John 8, is it John 8, 31? Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, if you abide in my word, that word abide there is the same Greek word as the abide in the, the story of the, the vine dresser and the vine and the branches, Right? Remember I taught on that maybe a year ago or so? Abide is not, is not Jesus is saying, those who, uh, if you abide, those who abide in my word, he's not saying those who carry it around. Okay? He's not saying those who carry it. Because anybody can carry a book. Anybody can carry this book. He's not even saying those who tie it to yourself, or glue it to yourself, or keep it in your pocket all the time. The word abide there in the Greek is to literally become, it's, it's not even to become fused. That doesn't even do it justice. Because what happens when a, when a branch, when a branch comes out of the vine, it's not fused to it. It has literally grown out of it. Do you understand? That's, that, I didn't get a lot of response there. Is that that's too deep? The branch literally was at one point a part of the vine. It's, in other words, it cannot be separated unless it's severed off, cut off by an outside force. You're, you're, you're one with the, with the vine. And that's what Jesus is saying. If you abide, if you become one, if you literally get produced out of my word, and we know that the word is Jesus, right? Because in the beginning was the word, capital W. Got to check that out and see if that word there is the same Greek word is John 1.1. 1, 1. Someone, someone check me out on that, who's got their concordance. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. Verse number 32. Wake up back there. Verse number 32. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I guess I could have just said that, but I wanted you to say it. And you know what they say, the response to that is? You don't have to put that part. But the response to this is, we're sons of Abraham. We've never been in bondage to anybody before. They're thinking in the natural. Here we go again. They're thinking in the natural. And here's Jesus in the supernatural. And this is a theme all through the four Gospels. Jesus is constantly trying to speak to people in the, in the, in the now I'm thinking of this one message that, that I heard 20 years ago as a kid from Jesse Duplantis. And it used to crack me up. Because he was jumping as Jesus and then jumping over as the disciples. And he would tell them, say things that Jesus would tell them. And the disciples would just be like, what is he, ta like, what is he talking about? And that's what's happening here. He's, Jesus is saying, if you abide in my word, if you remain in my word, if you become one with my word, then the Son makes you free, right? You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And their response to that is, well, we're not, we're not slaves, so you must have it wrong. 
These Jews, they were believers. Go back to, if you go back to verse number 31. They believed in Jesus, but they were stuck in religion, like many Christians are today. Stuck in religion. They were not bound. They were not possessed. They weren't, in, maybe some of them were, but I'm saying generally speaking for the, for the point of this message today, they were not in bondage, but they were stuck and needed freedom, or else Jesus wouldn't have said, you'll then know the truth, and the truth will make you free. In other words, you're not getting all the truth. In other words, you're in religion up to this point. You've been studying the law, you've been doing your, your you've been reciting your, your traditions, and you're doing good at it. You've got your, you, hold your, you hold on to your Torah, and this is all good, but he's saying you still don't know the truth. You still don't know the hundred proof truth. And once you do, once you know the truth, and become one, remain, abide in my word, then you will be free. Okay? Being stuck as a Christian is extremely frustrating. Can anybody, don't, you don't have to put your hands up, can anybody relate to that? Because I certainly can. I, I asked to not put your hands up and a bunch of people just shot him up. Because that's, that's, that holds true to certain people. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of times right now in my life that I remember being stuck, whether it was as a teen or whatever, even in adulthood. You get in these ruts, you know, and, and you don't need hands laid on you. You need to get disciplined. You need, to, you need to crucify the flesh, okay? You don't have to put the slide up, but there's things that contribute to being stuck, okay? Hanging out with, in, in, in the wrong relationships. 1 Corinthians 13, right? Evil company corrupts good morals, that word evil there is not evil like, um, like uh, satanic. The word evil there just translates what ought not to be. You know, you invest your time into people that live like they ought not, and you're not influencing them, expect to be influenced. Expect to, to be corrupted to some degree. Don't get mad at me. It was, it was uh, Paul that said to the church of Corinth, right? These are things that get us stuck. Um... What's one of my other things? Uh, uh, feeding on the wrong food. Uh, I do want to show you this, this, this slide. Uh, put the food slide up. This, this is a simple analogy, but you'll understand what I'm saying. Um, when you feed, okay? I was just talking to Mark in the back. He's a chef. And I knew this to a certain degree, but he was telling me how, how and I don't think this is conspiracy theory, I believe it 100%, how the places that serve some of the stuff on the right side of our screen actually put and inject certain chemicals into the food to make us want to keep coming back and, and eat it more, right? And, and I told the first service, when you throw down a couple pies, I'm talking about pizza pies, I'm not talking about, well, those, you know, regular pies too, lemon meringues too, whatever. When you throw down a few pies, why am I, I'm like, why am I, like, I just subconsciously was being drawn to the french fries. That literally happened. I'm not even, I'm not even making that up. That literally, there's something in this stuff that they make us want to keep coming back. <laughs> look up on the walls right there. They look so real. It's not even HD. The, the fried foods, the pizzas, the sugar, right? It, it feels good for a little bit. Right? Right? Louie, me and you were just talking about this the other day. It feels good. You get a rush, you know, on the sugar. What do they call it? Comfort food, right? You need comfort food when you're, when you're feeling good. When you're feeling down, you need some comfort food. You need some deep fried Oreos and, and macaroni and cheese. And the more saturated fat, the better. The more, you know, the more whatever, the more it'll comfort you. And it feels good. It feels comforting for about an hour. And then an hour later, it's going to get real uncomfortable. You know what I'm saying? Okay, now, literally and metaphorically speaking, it's, 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 it's not good. It's not garbage in, garbage out. Right? This keeps you stunted. It keeps you stuck. Or, at worst, and here's kind of the point I was trying to bring out. Jesus says to the church of Laodicea in, in, in Revelation 3.15, that I'd rather you hot or cold. Don't be lukewarm. So is it possible to be lukewarm, to be stuck and literally? Yeah, it's, it's absolutely possible. But Jesus doesn't want it. He says just do one or the other. I, I, that, that, that rocked me as a kid. I mean, that, that to this day, when people say, what's your... Um, I wouldn't say it's my favorite verse because it's 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 kind of convicting and challenging. I, I'd rather I'd rather be encouraged and motivated with my favorite verse. So I want to I want to leave like that's well that's how most people are. They want to be encouraged, right? <laughs> so I'll just keep it real. It's not my favorite, but it's probably the most important to me. 
Revelation 3.15 is probably the most important verse in the Bible to me. It, it changed my life as a kid, and I still uh, feel that, that conviction today. Because Jesus is saying, I'd rather, if you're stuck in the middle, just, just get off, man. Wow, that's like, that's like, that's challenging and convicting. Like, get in or get out. Get hot or get cold. And a lot of believers say they are stuck. They're not progressing. And they're not digressing. Keep the food up for a second. But just keep in mind, when you, when, you, when you stick with this type of diet, you can at best be stuck. At worst, you could damage yourself. At worst, you can, you can get unhealthy. Get out of shape. Right? Clog your arteries up. This stuff here, this doesn't taste as good. I didn't feel drawn to that when I was walking over there, right? It doesn't taste as good, okay? I'm not an avocado man. I try because I know it's like a superfood. I just can't get them down. Don't like them. I don't even know what these are. Maybe some quinoa, some oats or protein, some spinach. That's some uh, grass-fed organic heavy cream right there from Whole Foods, A1 cows. You got your fruits, your veggies, your olive oil. Yeah, you got things that aren't necessarily as exciting as these things over here. They're not necessarily, yeah, they taste all right. But they are, they're, 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 these things cater to the taste buds. While these things cater to your life. i got to say that again. Keep this slide up for a second. These foods that are, that are marketed to us, right? They are, they are marketed to our taste, our palate. It's kind of like church today, Pastor Donnie, right? Or Christian TV. Mm, I got a mm -hmm, that's right. I got a mm -hmm from the soundboard. Be careful, though. Be careful. Because some things that are palatable, spiritually, that you feed on, some things that are pal palatable, some things that encourage you, your life verse that, you know, I'm more than a conqueror, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, that's good stuff, man. But there's, there's, there, and you got to be in context, right? There's, there's deeper than just the good stuff, just the palatable stuff. When you dig into this type of a diet, it's not only nice to your palate, nice to your taste buds, but to taste buds. It's feeding your body. It's feeding your life source. It's feeding your brain. It's feeding your muscles. It's feeding you healthy things that will help you thrive as a, as a human, right? And, of course, these things are more expensive. They cost more. You said they cost more. They're harder to get down at times. Right? You, don't, you can't all the time, you can't all the time get them in quantity and in bulk. Because something usually, that's quality, isn't packaged in bulk. Because if it's packaged in bulk, there's a reason. Right? Jesus said you got to count the cost. Turn the box around. I did a, a youth conference with George Seawright years ago, and that was his message on the night he was preaching. It was, he had a box, I forget what it was, chocolate or something, and he said, you got to turn the box around, and then you, it tastes good, but wait until you see the ingredients. Maybe it was cereal or something. I, I, if it was cereal, I'd probably turned off in that moment because I'm a cereal guy. That's my favorite food coming from the guy who's preaching on this today. I've, I've gotten into the, the healthier cereals. But every once in a while, man, I just want a bowl of smacks, I'll be honest. With you. <laughs> or apple jacks. They, they just made apple jacks with marshmallows. Oh my gosh. It's so bad for you. It's red 40, and it's just bad stuff. Anyway, if you're not yielding fruit, you are stuck. That is. That is. If I told you, if you were flies on the wall in first service, you would have thought I was torturing the congregation. I think I could literally, we've had quiet services before in the first service, but I think I could count the responses on one hand that I was, it was, it was like, you know, it was, I was tormenting them. I know this is tormenting to hear at times and it's challenging, but this is a little bit of the, if I could say, in all due respect, this type of, of, of um, teaching, this type of, these themes in the Bible, this is the spinach, this is the salmon, this is the kale, right? This is, this is the, the stuff that it's what our spirit needs, okay? It's not always palatable. 
So it's not always smooth going down, right? You blend up, you, you, you blend up a bag of kale and spinach and lemon and ginger in your juicer. It's tough going down, man. It makes you, that's got some bite to it at first. But you know you're, you're, you're feeding your soul, man. You're feeding your body good stuff. That's the type of, forget, forget, I was at first going to say, this is the type of preaching that's like, forget preaching. That's the type of living we need in the body of Christ today. We have, we have changed our living to palatable Christianity. We have changed our living to being, to, and, and, and consequently, we get stuck as believers. We get stuck in our walk with God. We wonder why we're not producing and yielding the fruit of the Spirit. We wonder why there's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, uh, self-control. I think I forgot one in there. But we, we read those in Galatians, and we're wondering why are these things not exuding out of us? And remember, if you don't, it's, if you can't pick and choose. Okay, the fruit of the spirit is not a buffet. You don't get to pick and choose. Like in a drink, you know, at the juice bar, like I'll take love, a little bit of joy, not too much self-control because I like, I, I, I like to be in control. A little bit of self, just a pinch of self-control. Uh, put a whole lot of gentleness in there. I can handle that and blend it all up. That's not how it works. When you're in the spirit, everything should be, or no pun intended, organically exuding out of you. When you're living a spirit-led life, all the, the traits of, of the spirit, right? Not just one or two or seven or eight of them, but everything should be coming out. And if that's not happening, then you to some degree are stuck. That's a bad feeling to be stuck. Now, when I was a kid, I can remember uh, 13, 14 years old, we had a little gym in the basement. And it was a large gym compared to some other people's garage gyms and basement gyms. But my dad collected pieces of equipment over the years, and, and, and we had this gym, and, and a lot of my friends would come over after school from, from uh, high school and stuff, and they thought it was the coolest thing. But I was taught in that basement uh, how to work out, how to exercise. And my favorite thing to do, like most young men, young 14-year-old, 15-year-old teens, my favorite thing to do is bench press. I loved to bench press. That's kind of the universal gym exercise. And, and um, I can remember going through a season uh, where, where, my, where my body was changing so much in this, this growth spurt where every week where dad would put me on the bench and, and we would log the, the, the weight that I was able to do, right? And then he would say, okay, next week we're going to add 10 pounds. We're going to try, you're going to try to do, you know, this week you did 125 pounds. Next week we're going to try 135. And, you know, before I knew it, I was a lot stronger than when we started and that was the highlight of, one of the highlights of my week was to get on the bench and do the repetition. You could just switch me over to my lapel for a minute here. Um, can you hear me? Now, the growth happens, the growth happens on the rep in and exertion back out. Okay? That's where the growth of the muscle takes place. So, you got to go all the way down, and you got to go all the way up. But I can remember him at times saying, don't do this without me, whatever you do. Don't go downstairs and bench without, without me because you can get stuck. And I can remember once or twice it actually happened when I was a kid. And I can remember getting down, putting a little bit too much on, and getting here and being like, like, and it was either die or yell upstairs for your mommy to come rescue you. And I don't remember if he was home or somebody, somebody rescued one, one time I didn't have collars on. I just tipped it and the weights fell off. But that was, that's dangerous, you know. So he'd always say, make sure you don't do this without me because it's dangerous and you can get stuck. But when I'd get sometimes with him, when I was, when I was um, trying to go for a, a, a high, right, a new weight, I can remember sometimes as a kid feeling right about here. Gets right about there. I go, oh, no, I can't do it. Take it. Take it. I'm, I'm struggling. I'm struggling. Take it. He go, come on. Get through the sticking point. That's what he would scream at me. Get through the sticking point. If he was here, he would remember exactly what I'm talking about. And what he was trying to train me to do was, because really, that, 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 that point where I just was, that can only last so long. Right? You're either going to get crushed or you're going to crush it. And being stuck is the worst feeling in the world. Because you have not defeated what you set out to defeat. 
You've not conquered what you set up. You can't reach your destination when you're stuck. Now, there's times where you need a spotter to come in and pick it up. There's times where you need a spotter. What a great... That would have been a good... Remember, remember those... I shouldn't call them corny because they're kind of cool. Remember those things that were popular in the 90s where Jesus would be behind, like, a baseball player? Or, you know, he, that would have been cool. Jesus was a spotter on a bench press. But he's like that spotter. And sometimes he's standing on... He's standing here, and he needs to spot us. But church, if I can say in a non-judgmental, non-critical way, just brother to brother, brother to sister, in a challenging way, there are times where we don't need a spotter. There are times where we have just got to power through. There's times where we have to be disciplined to a certain degree, put flesh aside, okay? You go a couple of verses up in Galatians with the fruit of the Spirit, and you see the arch nemesis of the fruit of the Spirit. You see the adversaries of the fruit of the Spirit. Do you think it's coincidence that Paul put them in the same exact context? No, you'll yield one or the other. This being stuck thing, it works for a little while. But just like being on a bench press, you could only be stuck for so long. You will eventually, if you live a Christian life, a Christian walk of stuckness, right? You will eventually digress into the flesh. Or you will say, I'm not, I'm not doing this stuck thing. I can't, I, I'm, not gonna, I'm not taking this. This is, this is frustrating. I'm not reaching my destination. I'm putting myself at risk and others. I'm powering through. And that's where you have got to get as a, as a believer. As a weightlifter, when you're on the bench, that's how you grow. Powering through the moment when you feel like, I can't do this. I can't do this. Well, i got to do it. i got to do it because I've got a goal. As a Christian, i got it. I can't feel like I can't do it. I feel like I can't, but I, but I have to do it. My spirit, man, knows that I have to do it. I haven't even looked at this yet. Jesus. Let's camp out there just for the last couple minutes that we have, just so we can pile some more conviction on you. I want you to be <laughs> dripping, dripping with conviction. Sometimes I'll, sometimes I'll text with Pastor Dennis Shearer, and I'll, I'll text me and say, when are you preaching next? He said, make sure you whip the people. Make sure you... <laughs> or I'm ready, to, I'm ready to beat them, I'll say sometimes. <laughs> and it's a joke. I promise you that's a joke. No, no pastor likes to whip his people. Except that one pastor on YouTube. That's a really good YouTube video where he's screaming at the congregation. But I didn't say it. Edit that part out of the video. Don't put that live. I don't want to get in trouble for that. Galatians 5. Let's look at it. What does he say? You know what I'm talking about, Joy? You see that one? Now the works of the flesh, verse number 19, Galatians 5, the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness. I'm going to grab the, the handheld again, guys. Verse number 20, idolatry. See, some of these things here are so blatant that it's like we glaze over it. Because like, well, I'm not, a, I'm not an adulterer, you know. Most of us don't even know what the word lewd means, but you figure, well, I don't know what it means, so I guess that I'm not lewd. <laughs> if I can't pronounce it, I'm not it. Sorcery, I'm definitely not, I'm definitely not, definitely not a sorcerer. Harry Potter, Larry the Otter, all these things, I'm definitely not a, definitely not a sorcerer. Jealous, well, maybe a little bit. Idolatry. You don't think we're an idolatrous nation? Just put the TV on next week, Channel 2, all right? I'm saying that because the Giants aren't playing. If the Giants are playing, I might, you know, have not had the freedom to say that. Seriously, though, we worship. We worship we've, we've made idols out of things. We've worshipped our, our stuff. And I'm not being, I'm not being silly or like... Goofy about this, you have to keep every aspect of, of this portion of scripture in check. Some are easier than others. Some are, some are, you know, not committing adultery, in my opinion, is not hard. Okay, I know that's not everybody's testimony. Some people have fallen. We, we, we receive God's forgiveness, we receive his grace, and we move on. We don't excuse it. We change, we repent. I heard Robert Morris preach, preach a great message once on the word repent. It's not only to, to, to turn around and change, but that's the main part of it, right? To turn around and change, we get that. 
But some of these things, it's easy to, to open, to crack the door. And that's it. That's, that, that, that devil man, he's a snake, right? He's a serpent. And you know those serpents don't have backbones. They don't have vertebrae. So they can slither in. They can slither in anywhere that there's an opening. And even with idolatry, like, I'll give you a stupid example. Like when I got my car, my most recent vehicle, when we had another baby and I realized we need more, we need two back rows now. Because this, this third back, this, uh, two, this one back seat is not going to be able to fit three, we had three in car seats at one time. Still do. And, um, and it's going to be four in, uh, in a couple months. And yeah, this car thing has got me really like... One more, and I'm going to be in the Salento Mobile. I do not want to be in that. I'll tell you that right now. Just the airport shuttle everywhere you go. And I don't want that. Ever, I, I swore to this church years ago. I swore to my wife. I made an oath, a blood oath, that I would never drive a minivan. I, will, I personally will not drive a minivan. That's just, I don't. Kristen drives one. She loves it. But <laughs> I just don't like vans. I'm just too cool for a van. I mean, this is the bottom line, right? I just, that, I won't do it. Oh, and I, and it's really pride, because when I drive Christmas car, it's a better drive. There's more space, there's, it's easier. You know, it's got the little DVD player for the kids. All they do is scream at each other when they're in my car, you know, because they got nothing to watch. So, we got, we get the new car. We got the three car seats, and I would even ask my family, Every single day, I love, and it's the car I'm driving now, the Durango. I love that car so much, and I was I was proud of proud of when I got it. I was I was great grateful, thankful when I when I got it, when I received it, and I vacuum it every single day, and wipe down the dash every day. I've had that car for over two years. My children have never ate, eaten in that car ever, not once. And some of you parents are like, I I won't let them eat. So if they're like start, I've done this before. If they're starving, like I pull over on the side of the road. I'm like, get out and eat the Cheez-Its or whatever, and then you can come back in. I will now. I think they may have snuck once or twice in the back because when I go in there to clean up, I see some wrappers sometimes. But for the most part, my rule is there's no eating or drinking, water only, no juice. I'm very, very meticulous about my vehicles. I've been like that since I was a kid. You know, uh, some of you remember the, 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 must, the Ford Mustang I used to drive when I was a teen, right? I used to clean that thing, wipe it down. I'm the same way. I just don't like mess in my car. Even in the back seat, I don't like it. I can sense it when there's mess. And I'm serious. I'm, I'm just, I'm keeping it real. I'm not trying to be goofy. I felt the Lord say a couple months back, you better be careful that you're not like, I mean, every day I would, and it's not like an hour thing, but I got the car vacuum. You know, I just plug it in and every day I'm vacuuming it. That's the way you keep it clean. You stay on top of it. And people would get in my car and say, did you just get this? I said, no, I just keep it clean. But I felt the Holy Spirit say, you just, you better be careful that you're not making an, an idol out of this thing. And consequently, I haven't vacuumed it in like five, four or five months and it looks like a pigsty now. <laughs> right? You let it go. I'm extreme like that. I'm either on the, butt, on the money every day or nothing. And right now I'm in one of those nothing modes. Plus, it's cold, so you don't want to want to get out and do it. But, man, we make idols out of everything. Not just our own personal possessions, right? Ah, oh, man, I better get out of here before I... <laughs> Paul saying these... Keep that, keep that up if you can, uh, that, that portion with the forks of the flesh. Paul saying, be careful about these things, right? Idolatry, sorcery, hatred... Ooh, you hate anybody in here? Hope not. Contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath. One of the, one of the translations says, um, I'm not sure which one it's for. One of, the, one of the translations says wild parties. Chew on that for a few seconds, all right? Heresies, dissensions, selfish ambitions. These are, continue, verse number 21, 
envies, murder, here we go, drunkenness, revelries. Pastor, just, just uh, talk a little bit about this last week. And the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in the time past, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Those who practice such things will be stuck. They're stuck. We have got to abandon the work, works of the flesh, church. And I know that it's difficult. I know it's tough. It's just like drinking the, 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 the kale and the spinach. It's, it's tough to get down. But this is the thing that keeps us, from, keeps us from becoming stuck. It's not easy. It takes discipline. It's not fun. Right? You know what's fun? Sin is fun. Being in the flesh is fun. Maybe not fun in the sense of, you know, enjoyment, but it's fun for your, for your flesh. Your flesh man desires it. Your flesh man craves it. What's that? What's that word? I'll share this with you real quick. Oh. Uh, where is it? Where is it? 1 Peter 2.11. Uh, yeah, uh, this was one of the things I was going to preach on today. 1 Peter 2.11. Abstain from fleshly, fleshly, unhealthy lusts. That war against the soul, okay? Fleshly lust, lust in the in the in the, uh, in the in the sense of the word. You would think you would always think that that means in a sexual connotation, right? And you think, well, if I'm not lusting, you know, if I don't if I don't have uh, sexual uh, perversion going on, I'm okay. This word fleshly lusts there translates to cravings, cravings, fleshly cravings. Fleshly desires, things that stroke your flesh, things that keep you stunted, and things that keep you stuck. When you're in the Spirit, you should be yielding fruit, yes, but you should also be being persecuted. You should be being ostracized. You should have some trials at times. Because trials, trials, rejoice in trials, right? Rejoice in trials. We just, we just said this in, the, in our healing class the other day, right? Rejoice in trials because trials produce perseverance or patience. And patience produces character. And character produces hope. Think about that for a second. It's a, it's a, it's a not so deep, but it's a deep theological principle. You cannot have faith without hope. Because faith is the substance of things hoped for. You, can't, you cannot have faith in operation when you have no hope. That's why the enemy tries to steal our hope, destroy our hope, keep us stuck, keep us stunted. Because faith is the substance of things hoped for. But we see that, that, that trials bring perseverance, produce perseverance or patience in our lives. And patience produces character, and character is the thing that produces hope. You can't have hope without character, and you can't have character without patience, and you can't have patience without trials. We get, we get rocked when we go through a trial. We get all messed up. We, we go through it. We, 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 we get freaked out. We can't handle it. We want to blame God. God, you said if I confess your word, if I said to the mountain, be thou removed, this stuff doesn't work. I'm going to leave the church. I'm offended. I'm this. I'm that. And all the while, God's saying, you're on the right track if you're going through a trial. You're doing something right if you're going through a tribulation or a trial. Because trials produce patience. I'm trying to teach you patience, God's saying. I'm trying to teach you perseverance. I'm saying, perseverance is the exact opposite of being stuck. When you're stuck, mentally speaking, I'm saying, the exact, the exact opposite of patience wants to set in. When you're stuck in traffic, when you're stuck in a moment, when you're stuck at a red light, it's got a terrible, terrible English connotation to it. Because I can't go anywhere. I want this to end. I want this season to end. Spiritually, remember, everything's opposite in the spirit. In the supernatural, everything is opposite than, than in the English. In the spirit, God is saying, when you're in a trial, that's the exact place you need to be. Because I'm testing your faith. I'm testing your perseverance. I'm growing you. And through your patience will come character. And through your character will come hope. And through hope, faith is the evidence of things hoped for. Your faith can be advanced. Your faith can be multiplied. Your faith grows when you have hope. Don't lose hope. Don't get stuck where many believers are today. Many believers are stuck. Don't fall into the trap of stuck. Power through. Musicians, you can come on up. Power through. Don't digress. Don't let the bar crush you. 
Discern when it's time to scream out to God, God, I need a spot. I need help. And discern when you don't need to do that. When you don't, there's the, 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 God, listen, he's, he's a gracious God. He reaches down and pulls us out of the pit, right? But there's times where we do it ourselves. When that spotter grabs the bar, you're not growing that muscle as much as it could be, as much as if you were doing it yourself. Where's the weightlifters at in here, right? You know what I'm saying? Because someone's coming in and assisting you. You don't need to, we don't need, we don't need God to rescue us out of every single thing that we go through. Every little thing we've got to scream for, oh, perseverance, patience, growing our spirits, yielding fruit, letting him prune us at times, right? Letting him snip the thing, some of these works of, of the flesh, some of these things, you know, let him snip them away. Let him, let him prune them right away. And not just the things that are easy for you, the things that are difficult. The works of the flesh that keep us bound at times. You'll get unstuck. You'll get free. 